let's just pray together. May the words of my mouth and the thoughts of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, Lord our God, our Rock and our Redeemer. Amen. Do you have a nickname? Nicknames often tell us something about a person's character, perhaps highlight a physical trait, or sometimes refer to something that the person has done in the past. When I was at school, my nickname for a short time was Bamba, after Bamba Gascoigne, the question master on University Challenge at the time. And that was because I was the only person in my class who enjoyed watching University Challenge. Gordon Sumner, lead singer of The Police, is best known to us as Sting. And he got his nickname because one day he wore a black and yellow stripy jumper to rehearsals. One of the band members thought he looked like a wasp or a bee. They called him Sting and the name stuck. Buzz Aldrin, the second man to set foot on the moon, was originally called Edwin. And he got his nickname because apparently his little sister mispronounced the word brother as buzzer. His family shortened the nickname to Buzz and Aldrin later made it his legal name. Sometimes nicknames are ironic, but also affectionate. Michael Edwards will forever go down in history as Eddie the Eagle. At the Winter Olympics in 1988, he became the first British competitor in the ski jump event since 1928. An ex-plasterer by trade, he had no sponsorship or support from the sports governing body. He competed using borrowed second-hand equipment. He knew that he had little, if any, chance at all of winning, yet he was determined to fulfil his dream of competing at an Olympic Games. As he landed after his first jump, the commentator shouted, the eagle has landed. And from that moment on, he was known as Eddie the Eagle. He didn't win the event, but his courage and determination won him the hearts and the admiration of the British public. And then some of the people that we meet in the Bible have nicknames too. John, Jesus's cousin, was called the Baptist because he went round preaching the good news and urging people to repent and be baptised. And the apostle that we now know as Barnabas was originally called Joseph. He gave generously to the poor and was so committed to encouraging the apostles in their mission that they renamed him Barnabas, which means son of encouragement. Today's reading from John's Gospel focuses on Thomas. Over the years, Thomas has acquired the nickname Doubting Thomas because he admitted to doubting whether Jesus had in fact risen from the dead. Now, I've got to confess, I have a bit of a soft spot for Thomas. I think a lot of us are more like Thomas than we care to admit. And I think there's more to him than his nickname suggests. So who was he? Well, we don't know much about him. But from piecing together the gospel writings, we do know that Thomas was a twin. He was known as Didymus, which means the twin. He was probably a fisherman who left his nets and everything he knew to follow Jesus. Now that takes a lot of courage. So why don't we remember Thomas as courageous Thomas? He was a loyal, brave follower of Jesus. Do you remember the story of Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead in John 11? Well, when the disciples tried to stop Jesus from going to Lazarus, saying it was far too dangerous because the people had threatened to stone him, it was Thomas who said, let's go to and die with Jesus. So why don't we remember him as brave Thomas? He was honest. He wasn't afraid to ask a question. In John 14, when Jesus is preparing the disciples for the time he must leave them, it's Thomas who asks Jesus the famous question, Lord, we don't know where we, you are going, so how can we know the way? To which Jesus gives the equally famous answer, I am the way, the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father 
except through me. So we can see that Thomas was brave, loyal and secure enough in his group to ask questions, honest enough to admit when he didn't know something. Up to now in the Gospel, we haven't really heard much from Thomas, but now all the focus is on him and his reaction to the resurrection. So close your eyes and imagine the scene. Three days after Jesus' crucifixion, all the disciples except Thomas are huddled together in the upper room. The doors are locked because they are scared of what might happen if the authorities come looking for them. They are bewildered, confused and grieving. And then out of nowhere, Jesus appears in the room, says, peace be with you and shows them his wounds. They're startled, dazzled and then overjoyed. And you can imagine the excitement and the clamour as they tell Thomas, we've seen the Lord. Now, we're not told why Thomas wasn't with them. Perhaps he'd been the only one brave enough and practical enough to go out and buy some food for them all. Or maybe he'd just needed time to process his thoughts. But I wonder how he felt at that moment, hearing that he'd missed seeing Jesus. Was he incredulous? Or was he jealous? Given the circumstances of his friend's death, it's not surprising that he doubts what they say. Unless I see the nail marks in his hand and put my fingers where the nails were and put my hands in his side, I will not believe, he says. You know, doubt in relation to faith is a complicated thing. Doubt may have an intellectual root and that's when it leads us to ask questions like, is the Bible really the word of God? Or did Jesus rise from the dead? People with intellectual doubts need answers in the form of hard, solid evidence. And they may spend hours researching what theologians and historians have to say in order to find the evidence that they need. But doubt is also driven by emotional factors. We find ourselves, don't we, doubting God's existence, his provision, his love and care for us when we are going through personal, difficult personal circumstances, an uncertain future, unemployment, bereavement, an unwelcome diagnosis, the inability to get over previous disappointments. All of these things can cause us to doubt. And the answer to emotional doubt is always found in emotional healing and renewing of the mind. Now, I think Thomas possibly had a mixture of both sorts of doubt, intellectual and emotional, just like many of us do. Imagine for a moment the turmoil in his mind. On the one hand, he has lived and worked alongside Jesus for three years. He's heard the miracles, seen the miracles and heard the teaching. And he's heard Jesus' promise that he would rise from the dead after three days. He desperately wants to believe what his friends are telling him. But on the other hand, he's just seen Jesus, his closest friend and teacher, die an agonising death on the cross. Did he feel let down? Betrayed? Thomas's hopes and dreams of the last three years lie shattered on the ground around him. So it's no wonder that he reacts as he does. It would be easy to criticise Thomas, to criticise ourselves even, for having doubts. So it's important to understand from the off that it is okay to have doubts. God created us. He gave us the ability to think and to ask questions. In fact, I think he delights in us asking questions. He wants us to engage with him. We will all have times when we question whether God exists, whether he cares about what we're going through. And if we're honest, I think that many of us will have had doubts at some point over the last 12 months. Having doubts, though, does not mean that we haven't got a faith. Look at Job in the Old Testament. Job suffered illness, financial ruin. Many in his family became ill and died and he was abandoned by most of his friends. 
Job suffered from an intense period of doubt as a result. Yet even in this time, he was someone whom God loved and listened to. God was not turned off by Job's doubts, neither is he turned off by ours. Thomas needed to understand what had happened in his own way. On an intellectual level, he needed to see the evidence for himself. He needed to see the risen Lord and to see the wounds. On an emotional level, he needed that same experience that the others had just recounted. A week later, Jesus meets all of Thomas's needs and he appears again to the disciples in the locked room and this time Thomas is with him. Again, the same greeting, peace be with you. And then Jesus invites Thomas to touch the wounds. Put your finger here, see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas immediately proclaims my Lord and my God. He is the first person in the Bible to say this. In that one moment, all his doubts are gone. And I like to think that if Jesus had given Thomas a nickname there and then, it would have been Believing Thomas. Thomas sees and immediately believes. And that makes me wonder where and how do we recognise Jesus as Lord and God for ourselves? We are all individual and unique, so those moments of recognition will be different for each one of us. Some of us will recognise Jesus as Lord as we read the Bible. Some of us will meet him through study and discussion. Others will see Jesus as Lord and God in the wonders of creation. And some of us will recognise his lordship and power when we experience his love or feel the peace of the Holy Spirit in challenging circumstances. Some people see doubt as a weakness. Now it's true to say that if we try to shrug the doubts off and bury them under the carpet, they can fester and grow and become something which gnaws away at our peace. But we, if we engage with our doubts in an open and active way, by focusing on God, reading and studying our Bibles, discussing our doubts with mature Christians, reminding ourselves of God's love and goodness, then we may find, well find, that going through periods of doubt and questioning can lead us to encountering God in new and powerful ways. Our doubts can lead us into a deeper faith. When Thomas recognises the risen Jesus as Lord and God, he is confronted with the possibility that his reality is too small, that his vision of what is possible is too limited. Tom Wright says that the resurrection isn't an alien power breaking into God's world, it's what happens when the creator himself comes to heal and restore his world. When we recognise Jesus as our God, that same breath that breathed life into the world breathes new life and light and hope into us. It becomes the, he, he breathes the transforming power of the resurrection into our lives. Jesus' resurrection power enables us to live in freedom from guilt and shame because our sins are forgiven. When we live in that resurrection power, we learn to see our lives from God's perspective. We can experience peace in challenging circumstances. We can look forward with hope and be absolutely confident in his love, trusting him completely with our families, our jobs, our health, our talents and our money. We can totally rely on Jesus to equip us to do everything that he asks us to do. That includes sharing the gospel message with others, healing the sick and ministering to the needs of all those around us, even if that task seems impossible to us. Jesus' resurrection power transformed this motley group of disciples from quivering wrecks who cowered behind closed doors into bold advocates for Jesus. Thomas went on to preach as far afield as modern day Iraq and Iran, winning many people for the faith before travelling to India 
where he established several churches. He was finally killed for his faith around 52 AD. If God can take Thomas with all of his questions and uncertainties and transform his life and use him so effectively, then he can definitely do the same with you and me and our doubts. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you that you understand us when we doubt, that you in, in, invite us to question and to engage with you. Please take our doubts and help us to overcome them. Make us firm and sure in our faith. Help us to trust you always. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.